Welcome to our 2021 Lab Root series. My name is Leah Lavery, Marketing Manager for Life Science Electron Microscopy from Thermo Fisher Scientific and your moderator today. This is the third webinar in our series and we welcome back any returning attendees and a big hello to new attendees wherever you are in the world. Many of you know Thermo Fisher from other life science areas, but I want to introduce you to the Life Science Electron Microscopy Division. Our Materials and Structural Analysis Division provides complete workflows from cryo-electron microscopy structural determination of macromolecular complexes to 3D reconstruction of tissues and cells. Cellular cryo-electron tomography is a high-resolution technique that enables electron imaging of the molecular machinery of a cell at close to native conditions. Today, our speaker, Alex Rigert, will be sharing how cryo-electron tomography is applied to answer various biological questions, and how the workflow can be combined with fluorescence imaging in one microscope for correlative microscopy. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. Alex's presentation today is titled, Turn on the Lights with Cryofib Tomography Sample Preparation. Alex works as a product marketing manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific. He developed and used cryofocused ion beam instrumentation for applications in electron tomography at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Munich and has more than 15 years experience in cryoelectron microscopy. Alex, we look forward to your presentation. Please be in. Yeah, thanks very much, Leah, for the introduction. Also from uh, my side, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Let me start with an overview about the two main imaging methods in cryo-EM. So this is single particle analysis and cryotomography. In single particle analysis, we basically study isolated proteins at a very high resolution, while we want to look at uh, the protein function in cells with cryotomography. Now, there's actually a good reason why we want to study proteins in their natural cellular context. And that's basically most proteins are not existing uh, in isolation. So they form multi-protein complexes or so-called macromolecular machines. And the only technique to study these uh, complexes within the context of the cell is actually tomography. Now, before we can apply cryotomography, we need to uh, prepare our specimens and freeze them. Um, and we have to do that in a very fast way. So that's why we rely on uh, so-called vitrification methods here. Um, vitrification is a rapid freezing process that avoids that uh, ice crystals can form during the freezing process in the cells. Um, these ice crystals would interfere with the ultrastructure and the imaging later on. So that's why we need to avoid them so instead of uh, slow freezing, vitrification is a very fast freezing process that um, embeds the samples in a so-called amorphous ice. There are two techniques available for achieving this. Uh, one is shown here on the left side, it's called plunge freezing or thin film vitrification. So that can vitrify samples up to uh, thicknesses of five microns. Anything that is thicker, um, and you can think here of some small organisms or some uh, tissue biopsies or for instance, some organoids, those would need to go into a different device, which is called a high pressure freezer. And uh, the technique is called high pressure freezing. This can achieve um, vitrification uh, thicknesses of up to 200 uh, micrometers. So these are basically the two methods to create vitrified specimens for cryo microscopy. Tomography can be done on uh, different types of samples. This is what is shown on uh, this slide here. There are different levels of complexity that come along with this different sample types. If you look here at the left side, so we look at samples such as uh, isolated proteins or virus particles. That's um, conceptually the same sample preparation as you would do it for single particle analysis. But then if we go here to the right, you can see the, the level of complexity basically increases. Um, and that also brings certain challenges with it. So um, on one hand, there is a difficulty in uh, localizing the region of interest, the more thick the sample gets. 
and it's already a challenge uh, to localize uh, regions inside um, cells. Um, but also there are different challenges coming on the preparative side. So that uh, implies the use, for instance, of a focused ion beam to make the samples accessible for tomography, to make the samples transparent for tomography. And uh, in terms of high pressure freezing, you see that that has probably the most complex um, requirements. It's not only a challenge to localize the region of interest, um, it requires a different freezing technique, a high pressure freezing. It requires a focused ion beam um, to excavate regions of interest. And on top of that, it also requires a lift out device um, where we can basically excise the regions of interest um, to bring them to a, a crit um, to uh, make them accessible for tomography. Let's take a look in this small animation how we prepare cells on crits for electron tomography. So the preparation starts typically with the cells that are in a petri dish uh, from the from the culture lab. Um, you take that dish and go to a vitrobot device. So this is a plunge freezing device. The cells will be localized um, uh, on top of an electron microscopy grid. They are typically embedded in a small thin layer of uh, buffer solution or media that has to be uh, plotted before the uh, plunging process. So by this plotting step, we can create basically a thin film. That's why the method is also called thin film vitrification. The grid is then rapidly immersed into a secondary cryogen. So that's uh, liquid ethane here. And this is basically the step when we have created uh, a vitrified sample on top of the grid. So with this grid, we can now proceed in the workflow uh, for cryotomography. Now, once you have vitrified the cells, you can take them to the cryo-TEM. In the cryo-TEM, you would probably see an image like shown on this slide. It shows a cell on the grid, and you can clearly see here, for instance, the cell membrane and also peripheral regions of the cell. So these are regions which are electron transparent. But you can also notice the problem. So as soon as we go uh, more towards the center of the cell, and you may notice here a phagosomal compartment, then one thing you see is that the signal to noise drops quite significantly. So that means at some point the sample is simply not electron transparent anymore. So that's why we need to go to a different instrument before. And this is a focused ion beam instrument, which can create electron transparent samples from such objects uh, on crits. And I will show you how that works in the next slide. So this slide shows you our Aquilos 2 cryofib system. This is a dedicated device for preparing samples for electron tomography. And it's a dual beam instrument. So dual beam instrument means that there are two columns uh, on this system. Uh, one is an electron column for scanning electron microscopy. And there's also a focused ion beam column. Now, the focused ion beam column produces a very fine focused beam of gallium ions that can be used to ablate uh, material from a, a cellular sample. And the way how that works is shown in uh, this little um, animation, which we'll take a look at now. So here we go into the system. Uh, this is a cryo specimen, so we load that on a cryo stage. We can use an electron beam to image the sample, as you would do in a scanning electron microscope. And then we use the ion beam that you can see here to manipulate the sample and remove areas uh, of interest. So the way this is done, how a lamella is created is shown here. The ion beam uh, removes material uh, from the cell. And what is left behind then is a thin uh, lamella, which is still connected to the sides of the, the cell. So by this, we can create a sample that is electron transparent and which allows us to take a look into the interior of a frozen hydrated cell. Here's a real life example how cryofib milling of cells on a grid works. Um, you can see here uh, frozen chlamydomonas cells or green algae cells. And you can see in this uh, image here the yellow boxes which indicates the areas the ion beam is going to remove. So you can easily uh, recognize here these are rather thick objects which are non-electron transparent. And what we are going to prepare from this object is a thin in situ lamella. So after ion beam milling, the result looks like this. You can see the lamella here. You can also see the areas where the ion beam have, has removed uh, material. And by this, we have created now an electron transparent lamella in the range of 200, 300 nanometers. 
that can be transferred to the cryo TEM for a tomography experiment. The image here on the right side shows you an overview of such a lamella in the cryo TEM. And you can see we created basically a very large cross section through the uh, green algae cell, which reveals a lot of subcellular morphology. So you can see the uh, thylakoids uh, system here quite well. You can see also the pyranoid, which is surrounded by starch. And you can see various subcellular organelles uh, in here. So there's plenty of room now to set up a tomography experiment on such a uh, in situ lamella. Once such a lamella has been created, the next step is to basically take it out of the focused ion beam system. So that's what you can see in this uh, small movie here, and then transfer it into a cryo TEM system. So this shows you the Cryos G4, which is a 300 kV uh, transmission electron microscope. And the actual tomography tilt series is acquired in that instrument. You can see that here. So we uh, basically rotate the sample under the electron beam and what that produces is a so-called projection series. Um, from that um, projection series, we can reconstruct a uh, tomogram, and that tomogram reveals then uh, basically a snapshot uh, of the frozen hydrated cellular interior. In this case, showing here uh, Golgi with surrounding uh, ribosomes and, uh, for instance, also the nuclear core. So this gives you detailed information uh, about the interior of cells at a very high resolution. The quality of cryo-electron tomography data is quite important, especially when it comes to subsequent image processing steps. So on the left side here, you can see an image from a tomogram, and you can see the, the structures of individual ribosomes. Those have been obtained by a subtomogram averaging technique. Um, so it's very important to have good contrast for this technique, and um, this can come from an energy filter. The energy filter is basically a device that is able to filter out the inelastically scattered electrons from the images, and thereby preserving to more uh, high-resolution information in the original images. So this slide shows you data that has been obtained with our Selectris energy filter. You can see a tomogram here, um, uh, which shows um, individual vesicles that are budding off from the Golgi complex. You, you may also see here uh, quite nicely the, the individual proteins that are uh, lining the surface of these vesicles. You can also see in tomography dynamic processes such as the, the formation, the budding off of such a vesicle from the Golgi. So that can be studied uh, only if we have a decent image data quality. And for this, the energy filter is a quite essential device because it can boost the contrast and preserve more high frequency information in the images. After this introduction into cryotomography, I would actually like to come back to the Aquilos II cryofib system and show you the current state of the art of this um, cryofib system. So the slide here shows you an overview um, across section schematic of the system with all relevant cryo uh, features. Um, central to a cryofib system is uh, the capability to uh, cool the stage and keep the stage cool. So uh, we have at the center of the system here uh, a cryo stage. This is a rotatable cryo stage, which is kept at uh, minus 170, uh, minus 180 degrees Celsius temperature. It's a gas cooled stage. So the gas for that uh, cooling comes from uh, nitrogen gas, which is sent through a heat exchanger in an offline Dewar. And so the cool gas is then basically used to uh, achieve the temperatures that are required for cryo work. Also important for a cryo system is the ability to load uh, samples into the system and then also out of the system uh, later. So this happens in an offline loading station. So in the loading station, uh, samples which are typically on a grid, as you saw that before, are loaded uh, into a small cryo shuttle. This device basically um, holds the, the EM grids or the HPF samples. It's uh, moved into a, a transfer rod and then under vacuum transferred to a load lock of the system. And once you've done the load lock cycle, you can push that sample onto the cryo stage. And once this is done, we can actually start to work um, with the beams on the sample. There's functionality such as an uh, integrated sputter coder. It's important to keep the samples uh, conductive, or to apply conductive platinum coatings 
onto the sample, so very thin coatings. There's also a GIS system, which is a gas injection system that is used to apply uh, thick platinum coatings, so that are uh, so-called protective coatings that um, help with the, with the milling process. We have a device here, which is a, the Easy Lift Cryo. This is a lift-out needle, which allows you to uh, do lift-outs, as I've shown before, for the high-pressure frozen uh, samples. And the latest add-on to the system, which I will also describe in more detail uh, today, this is an integrated light microscope, which we can use to inspect uh, fluorescence inside this um, system. So that basically gives you an overview of all the cryo-related functionality that comes with the uh, Aquilos 2 system. Leaving the schematic now, um, this is an image of the actual instrument. So you can see the Aquilos 2 with all its uh, accessories on, on this image. On the right hand side, you can see the loading station where we load the cryo specimens into a, a transfer device, which is attached here to the load log of the system. The cryo stage is uh, part of the, the high vacuum chamber here. You can also see on the left hand side of the system console the dewer. So this is used to cool down uh, the gas um, to maintain a, a cold supply of gas for cooling down the stage. Um, also, you can see on the left hand side of the instrument, uh, this is the retractable sputter coder device, uh, which is also part of the, of the Aquilus 2 system. There are also two um, optional components visible here. So uh, one is here on, on the front port, the Easy Lift micro manipulator system. So that's the lift out system that can be optionally selected for the system. And what is new this year, and what's what I'm going to introduce in the next slides, this is a new uh, integrated light microscope. So it's the IFLM correlative microscope that we are introducing this year to the Aquilos 2 system. So the Aquilos is a pretty complete system for the processing, manipulation, and imaging of cryo specimens. And I listed the key main features of that system uh, on this slide here again. So that's around automation capabilities for the lamella production process, imaging capabilities, uh, slice and view technique here, uh, the capability to perform uh, cryo lift out with the micro manipulation device, and then the latest add-on to the system, the integrated light microscope, which I will go into uh, details in the upcoming slides. So let me first go into a bit uh, overview about the, the other features before I'm coming back to the light microscope. The first feature I'd like to highlight here are the automation capabilities of the system. Uh, we have developed a, a special software for doing this. The software is called Autotem Cryo. So this is a dedicated version of the Autotem software which is around for, for many years already in the dual beam world. Um, and this software allows you to customize the milling pattern and, and uh, parameters and basically set up multiple sites for automated milling. So the image on the right hand side shows you a result of such an automation run. So you can see here several sites that have been selected before and marked for, for milling. And then we used Autotemp software basically uh, to carry out uh, uh, automated uh, milling process. And you can see here the final results. So these are all sites that have been produced autonomously with the help of Autotem Cryo software. The software is uh, quite flexible when it comes to adapting uh, the parameters um, to, the, uh, to a given cryo sample. Um, so there is a flexibility on selecting the milling patterns. There can be also extra options added, such as, for instance, adding here relief cuts uh, to the lamella uh, production process. And it's also possible with that software to uh, do uh, not only the coarse milling, but also the final polishing then of the lamella, so down to a thickness of um, 200 nanometers. So with the help of that software, we can, uh, and with the automation in general, we can increase, of course, the milling throughput and efficiency. And that's one of the uh, big assets of uh, an automation uh, software. Next feature I'd like to highlight is uh, Cryo Slice and View software, which is an integral part of the Aquilos 2 system. So this software allows you to, um, to obtain 3D data like you can see in this movie here on the right hand side. Um, it works by sequentially milling 
and imaging the, the cut surfaces with the electron beam. So I use the ion beam to produce the cut surface, then image uh, the uh, surface with the electron beam. And by doing this in a sequential fashion, you can acquire a 3D volume. You can see that here uh, for uh, such a chlamydomonas cell where you can nicely see the nucleus and the different Golgi complexes surrounding the cell. So this type of imaging gives us um, uh, contextual information about the sample. It's not a uh, high resolution as you would get it from electron tomography, but again, it can use or can be used to basically guide the lamella milling process. It's particularly interesting to apply that also in combination with hyperschafrusen samples, where you can use it to navigate where you are in a, in a rather complex bulk sample, um, just based on the on the cryo contrast signal that you see here. So the contrast uh, which you see here, this is um, secondary electron detection. And it's uh, all based on uh, charge-based imaging. So remember, there's no stains, uh, uh, which are kind of um, or heavy metal ions, which are part of this sample here. It's just a pure uh, native frozen uh, sample that we look at. So that kind of um, uh, is that information which um, Slicing View can give you from uh, such frozen uh, cryo samples. I mentioned already in the beginning uh, when, when I spoke about the uh, different sample types that tomography can be performed on. So um, the more complex the sample is, the more uh, bulk it gets, then at some point you cannot avoid uh, to do a lift out. The lift out basically allows you to excise a region from a, from a bulk frozen specimen. It can be also done for an on the grid specimen and to basically lift out a small chunk of cellular material. Um, with that uh, micro manipulator device and then bring this little uh, chunk. You can see that here in the images uh, below. So this is a lamella which has been prepared from such a sample. Uh, this can be uh, taken onto a lift out grid and then also transferred to the TEM for tomography. So that's the idea of the, the lift out system. Uh, we basically support both use cases with our easy lift system. Uh, we can do lift outs from samples that are grown on grids. So that uh, enables some different milling geometries compared to this uh, classical in situ lamella geometries. But the main purpose, of course, to enable also the work on HPF samples, so the more bulk frozen samples, uh, where you really need to lift out to excise uh, material. So the whole easy lift micro manipulator system is fully integrated into the Aquilos 2 system. And uh, again, this is also uh, active development, so we have already uh, best practice procedures developed, um, which also avoid, for instance, the use of a, a GIS system for the lift out so that we can um, yeah, more routinely apply lift out to uh, frozen hydrated samples. Yeah, with this, I like to introduce the uh, latest add on to the Aquilos 2 CryoFib, which is the IFLM correlative system. The uh, IFLM stands for an integrated fluorescence light microscope, and that brings uh, fluorescence imaging capabilities uh, to the existing uh, Aquilos system. So it is now not only possible to uh, do electron and uh, ion beam imaging within the system, but we can also add uh, fluorescence imaging capabilities to the same system. So coming back to the um, title of this webinar, we can prepare lamella as you, you saw that before. And now with that new system, we can turn on the lights with the help of the, the integrated light microscope and see whether our uh, fluorescent targets are contained within the produced lamella. So that is uh, all possible now by integrating a light microscope into the existing uh, Aquilos 2 uh, cryofib. The new option to do a correlative light microscopy directly inside the Aquilos 2 system brings uh, several advantages to the cryotomography workflow. You can see that workflow on this slide. Um, what you can also see here is that there are a number of transfer steps uh, included in the workflow. So from the moment you freeze the sample, you would typically go to an external light microscope and from the external light microscope into the cryofib system and then again into the cryo-TEM system. So these transfer steps always bear the risk for uh, contaminating the samples. So by integrating the light microscope into the cryofib system, we can eliminate uh, one sample transfer step and thereby also reduce the transfer contamination risks. 
By combining a light microscope with the uh, FIPSAM system, we can also simplify the electron uh, to light correlation um, by having two imaging modalities in one system. So this allows for a faster retrieval of the regions of interest, and we can basically achieve a higher throughput uh, with that. There's another interesting option when combining a light microscope with the cryofib system, and that's the capability to monitor and validate the lamella production. So what is meant with that? So um, currently you can either use a light microscope to select sites where you want to mill, but now since we have the system combined in one system, we can also use the light microscope to inspect or monitor uh, the pro lamella production process. So you can create a lamella, and once you have uh, finished the lamella, you can basically verify whether the uh, target, the fluorescently marked uh, target, is contained within that lamella. That's also quite an interesting for um, automation options. As I shown before, for Autotem Cryo software, you could automate the lamella milling process and then later use this integrated light microscope to uh, verify uh, which of the lamellas contain the target. So let's take a more detailed look of the IFLM optical module for the Aquilos 2. The IFLM is a uh, wide field optical solution. Uh, you can see the beam pass here on the uh, left hand side. Um, uh, it features an LED illumination source uh, with uh, four excitation bands, which are compatible with the most common uh, used uh, fluorophores. We couple in the beam uh, into the high vacuum chamber of the Aquilos through a special vacuum uh, compatible window here. And inside the Aquilos high vacuum chamber, we then have the objective. This objective is connected to a piezo, uh, which allows us to do the focusing uh, on the grid. Um, there's also a special shuttle available so that we can image um, the sample on the cold stage. And then on the emission pass, basically light goes through the dichroic um, passes the emission filter here and goes to the detector uh, and the camera. So we are currently in the process of um, finalizing the selection of uh, both objective and, and camera um, with the goal to find here the optimal choice between both um, components. Quite important is also that we uh, provide a range of dedicated Aquilos shuttles for the light microscope. So there will be shuttles compatible with a lift out use case as well as um, autocrits um, for the in situ lamella milling use case. Um, and we also, of course, make sure that this system is fully compatible to all the cryo accessories and, and features that I showed you already earlier. Um, one thing to mention here is, for instance, the sputter coder. Um, so you need to uh, make sure that this is also still working, and that's something which we guarantee on our system full compatibility uh, with, the, with the existing Aquilos 2 system. Let's take a look now at a few application examples taken with the IFLM system. Uh, first image shows you an overview of a frozen grid here with, uh, with cells on it. You can see uh, a lot of cell clusters which are here visible on the grid. You can also see some meshes on the grid uh, which contain just the carbon foil. Now, with the capability uh, to have the light microscope integrated into the FIPSAM system, we can literally uh, turn on the light and uh, identify fluorescence uh, on that grid. Uh, and that can actually help us then to select uh, regions which are suitable for uh, lamella milling or even to select then, uh, certain phenotypes based on the fluorescence uh, signal. This image shows you how we can utilize the light microscope during the lamella production process. So you can see an SEM image here, top-down view of a lamella that has been prepared. So this is still a coarse lamella. And uh, now while this lamella preparation process is underway, we can actually check back and, and see whether the targets are contained in the lamella by just uh, turning on the light microscopy information. You can see that here. It can be easily overlaid um, with the existing SEM image so that we can verify that a certain target is also contained uh, within the lamella. One advantage in uh, the lamella production is that we physically thin the sample 
and thereby we also eliminate a lot of out of focus light that is intrinsic to the wide field system. You can see that on the right hand side here of the slide, so you can see here uh, nuclei which are stained, which light up in the wide field system. Um, but as soon as we go to the area where we have the lamella prepared, we basically eliminate all that blur from the uh, wide field system because we physically thin the sample to uh, 300, 400 nanometers here, which eliminates the out of focus uh, light. So that gives us a better resolution inside um, the thin down regions. And we can also uh, use that information to overlay and correlate then the light microscope information for instance here on the positionings uh, of the of the nuclei. The next image shows you another example for lamella preparation where we can benefit from the physical thin uh, thickness of the sample for the fluorescence imaging. So we can also utilize here the contrast which we obtain by Kyo's Slicing View imaging. So again here, um, this is a cryo-contrast image which reveals um, some uh, cellular structures uh, to be contained in this um, lamella. So you can clearly see here the nucleus, there's another one cut, and there are some cellular components. And we can now use the fluorescent signal um, to correlate what we see. In this case, the nuclei is stained with a Hux dye. Uh, while the green signal here corresponds to some mitotracker signal, and we can here see um, some spots which are lighting up in green, uh, which correspond to uh, a positive labeled uh, mitochondria uh, on that lamella. So that's the type of signal that we can obtain with the system from uh, thin lamella samples. Now the IFLM will come with its own imaging and control software. You can see a snapshot of the interface here. So that software doesn't require an offline uh, PC to run, so it's part of the microscope PC. And it features all the functionality that is required to um, uh, obtain fluorescence images. There is a way to cycle back and forth between the SEM, FIP positions and the LM positions, so that you can basically go back and forth between SEM, ion beam uh, imaging and the fluorescence imaging positions. There is a control field where you can adjust the focusing approach. And of course, there is a field where you can basically select the excitation lines and adjust the illumination parameters. Um, there will be also a histogram uh, where you can adjust the different channel information. Um, so that's um, all integrated into this user interface um, of the light microscope software. Um, information that is taken um, at a given position with the light microscope um, contains coordinate information that can be later imported also into MAPS software, uh, which facilitates then the correlation between the light microscopy and the um, SEM signal. I mentioned it already before, there's also a dedicated um, cryo shuttle coming with the IFLM uh, microscope. You can see an image here on the right hand side. Um, this shuttle is optimized on the pre tilt angle for imaging, uh, for perpendicular imaging of autocrits uh, with the system. And the other important thing on the cryo shuttle is that it has to be, of course, fully compatible uh, with the uh, other use cases and features of the Aquilos 2 system. I mentioned before the, the retractable sputter coder. For instance, so this is a quite essential thing to uh, have uh, a shuttle that is fully compatible with all the existing features uh, on the Aquilos 2 system. Besides the ability to do fluorescence imaging with the IFLM, we can also do reflection imaging mode with the system. So you can see that on the top row panel here. So um, this is all images which are taken with the IFLM while the lower panel here is taken uh, with the uh, SEM. So these are SEM images. And the reflection imaging capabilities are quite important in order to find uh, align and correlate images from the light microscope to existing SEM signal. It can be quite difficult if you have a sparse fluorescent signal to properly correlate it. And in this case, uh, you can use a reflection signal uh, to make sure that the signal can be uh, well aligned with um, SEM uh, imaging signals. So here's the lamella I showed previously, and we basically used the uh, reflection imaging signal 
uh, to correlate uh, the fluorescence with the cluster of cells from which we prepared that lamella. You can see that here. This is the ion beam image um, showing the cluster of cells. This is the corresponding um, uh, fluorescence image, which has been aligned with the help of the uh, reflections uh, image here. Um, you can see quite a lot of details in the reflection imaging here on the, on the grid surface. You can even notice here in the lamella um, there's always a small part of the uh, residual carbon foil remaining in it, which lights up here in the reflection uh, signal. And from that lamella, that's basically the image as I showed before. This again shows then the overlay of the fluorescence signal from the final prepared uh, lamella. So the challenge for all uh, correlative microscopy techniques um, in the cryo field are to guide the lamella milling process as precise as possible. Ideally, you really want to know the exact localization of a, of a highlighted feature of interest within your cell and prepare lamella from that. Now that's uh, a, a challenge. There have been some ways proposed how to overcome that. Uh, Fiducial-based correlation is a way to increase the targeting accuracy in both uh, wide field and confocal microscopy. But of course, we also have to live with the fact that the resolution that we get in cryo microscopy and cryo light microscopy is usually not sufficient to, uh, to target within the volumes that we need for cryo electron microscopy. Nevertheless, there are approaches available. And I think uh, there are two things which are important here on the integrated light microscope. We have the option with that system to, of course, monitor this process. And we can uh, either use a fiducial-based correlation technique or a simple 3D transformation to become better in the targeting of features inside the cells. So this slide shows you a very simple um, way, basically, to correlate um, signal when, when it comes uh, to um, cellular imaging, um, when we have a sufficiently um, a large cellular object where we can uh, take with a focal stack basically some information about the height of the feature of interest. Then we can use that information to adjust uh, the transformation in the ion beam image. So that works uh, relatively simple. You take a reference point and the distances to your feature of interest in the SEM view. The SEM view is a top-down view. It's the same view that you will also get with the integrated uh, fluorescence light microscope. Um, from the uh, IFLM, you can uh, take the Z-Stack information from a focus series. And uh, based on these two information, so the Z-Stack information and the position of your feature of interest, you can basically target um, or kind of estimate where you have to target um, your lamella. So that gives you a positioning uh, information uh, which, which you can apply to the ion beam image and then uh, prepare the lamella milling process. So the advantage of having an integrated light microscope on board uh, the Aquilos 2 system is that we can um, monitor this uh, lamella creation process and verify whether a certain feature is still contained within the lamella that we are targeting. So here's an example how that could look like. Uh, again, you take the SEM top-down view here of a cluster of cells. You can see them here uh, on the carbon support film. Um, you can overlay that information with the fluorescence uh, signal uh, uh, information and then basically uh, select a certain cluster of mitochondria in this example here in the vicinity of a nucleus. And uh, you can uh, take the distances as I shown uh, before on the slide, uh, which will bring you uh, to an approximate positioning uh, of the milling boxes. And then you can start the milling process. So now as you do the milling process, you have identified where, you, where your feature will be, where your milling boxes should be. And then you start basically the milling process. So you start with a coarse milling step where you first remove uh, uh, a bulk quantity of the material around it, uh, leaving a, a rather thick coarse lamella uh, remaining. And then you can basically take the fluorescence to see whether you are still on track uh, with targeting your cellular features. So you see this cluster of cells here in the uh, non sint um, samples. And then we kind of start the coarse sinning of the sample here. So we have a, a bulk lamella which remains. And we can use this checkback function of the light microscope to see whether we are still on track, whether we still have the feature uh, contained within that coarse lamella. And as we physically go 
uh, more thin towards the final polishing of the lamella, reaching 240 nanometers. In that case here, we can still verify in the end that we have the feature contained in the lamella. So that's something which wouldn't be possible with an external system because it would involve a lot of going back and forth between a light microscope and external one and the Aquilos cryofib system. So that's a clear advantage of having a system integrated into the cryofib that you can do this um, inspection, validation or monitoring of the uh, lamella production process. So this is the final result of this demonstration. So on the left side, you can see the SEM image of the final lamella. And on the right hand side, you can see the same lamella transferred into the cryo TEM. So on the left side, lamella, we uh, initially targeted a cluster, um, which was here. So we can overlay that information with the fluorescent signal and can still see that we contain a part of this uh, structure, which we initially targeted. And of course, in the TM signal, we can then uh, relocate this um, feature again by again uh, correlating the fluorescent signal, which corresponds also nicely to some structures, uh, for instance, like the labeled mitochondria, which are visible in the TM lamella. So that shows that um, this approach is uh, capable to, to target um, or guide us, guide the targeting process to the right spot and um, shows also again the, the versatility of having a, a microscope on board the Aquilos 2 system, which can uh, yeah, monitor and track this uh, preparation process. Yeah, with this I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I hope I was able to share some insights with you about tomography and cryofib sample preparation. I also hope that you were able to see uh, the value of this new uh, light microscope that can be added to the Aquilos 2 system. I think it's a great system that will really simplify the light to electron correlation process. And I also hope I was able to show you uh, a bit how it can be used uh, to validate the fluorescence inside lamellas uh, before, during and after milling. So um, yeah, thanks again from my side for attending this uh, webinar and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks very much. The Thermo Scientific Aquilos 2 Cryofib with IFLM Correlative System combines light and electron microscopy into one instrument. In the system, fluorescence data can be overlaid on SEM images, allowing the localization of fluorescently labeled cells. With integrated fluorescence, you can monitor fibrillin to ensure cellular target regions are within the final lamella. Fluorescence integration gets rid of an extra transfer step, making correlation between light and electron microscopy easier and faster. Search less, discover more, Illuminate your cryotomography workflow with the power of integrated fluorescence in the Aquilos 2 Cryofib. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the Aquilus video while we transition to our question and answer session. Let me start by saying thank you to Alex for your informative presentation. Uh, my name is Leah Lavery and I'll be moderating the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, our first question. Alex. How thin do you need to make your lamella for imaging? Uh, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. So um, typically, uh, such a lamella is 200, 300 nanometers in uh, thickness. Um, the thickness always depends on the, the mean free path that you can uh, that you that you need to take into account when imaging them with a, for instance, 300 kV TM system. On the other hand, you also need to make sure that the feature of interest you are interested in kind of is accommodated in that volume. So 
Uh, I think typical volumes are between 200 and 300 nanometer thickness. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, is the lift out manipulator cooled by liquid nitrogen too? Uh, good question. It's not not actively cooled by um, liquid nitrogen. It's it's taking plates from uh, from inside the system from a cold shield, which connect to the um, tungsten needle, so that we can keep the needle at uh, minus hundred, um, I think sixty five degrees Celsius, so that we have a a cold needle uh, that we can use for that process. Okay, thanks. You know, so we had several questions about the the integrated um, IFLM, so. The first question is, um, is photo bleaching a problem? Yeah, this is also a good good question. So, I mean, there are two things here. So, on, on one hand, um, under cryo, you, you benefit from reduced photo bleaching rates. So, that's uh, an advantage. On the other hand, we have the system integrated into a uh, scanning electron microscope. So, that means if we scan the, uh, the labeled sample or, or uh, the fluorescent sample with the SEM beam, then we can uh, deplete the fluorescence. So that was also one of the motivations why we um, added a reflective imaging mode to the system. So we can use the reflective imaging signal to basically correlate um, surface details um, from the sample. Okay. Um, and is the IFLM limited to only to the Aquilos 2 or later possible? And is it possible to install an already working Aquilos 1 first generation system? Yeah, the system is um, made for the Aquilos 2 system. So in that case, you would need to uh, go for an upgrade and uh, to upgrade the, the 1 to the 2 system. Okay. Um, is it possible to use the fluorescence microscopes in the coincidence point, or do you have to move the stage from the coincidence point to the image with fluorescence? This is also a very good question. It would be really nice to have it in the in the same coincidence point. That would be the ideal situation. Unfortunately, with the current light microscope objectives, that would collide with the position of the pole piece and uh, the geometry in the system. So we have to move to an offline imaging position. That means the stage has to move in XY uh, for to the LEM to the LM imaging position. Uh, next question is, uh, could you estimate the timing for one of the IFLM imaging checkback cycle of a typical MLF? Yeah, the checkback basically works like <clears throat> you do the milling and then you move to this um, light microscopy imaging position. You kind of do a, you can save the positions to go there quickly and do the focusing and take an image and then move back. So that will not take uh, very long. So I don't have the time. For that in mind, but um, this is a way how you can do it, and that's also the idea of that you can yeah, see the or monitor the progress of lamella uh, production. I also want to say it's it's not a guarantee that you always have the feature um, of interest in there, right? The thing I showed um, on the way, you can use that for targeting, for estimating where a feature of interest is, to mill down the sample and to kind of um, validate it with the system is a way to do that. So it's not a guarantee that it always works. On the other hand, it's, it's also great um, because it can help us to save some TEM time. Um, even if it's not working, then we know that this lamella site is not suitable and we don't need to spend the time in the TEM to, to investigate it. Okay, great. Uh, does the ISLM focusing require a sample Z position change? Can you repeat that question, Leah? I didn't hear that okay. far. Yes, because okay, so does the ISLM focusing require a sample position change in the, the z-axis? Uh, no, the, the focusing is not done with the stage. So the, the focusing is done with a piezo uh, objective drive. So the, the objective is moved to uh, to do the focusing and also to do uh, to record, for instance, the focus stack in the software. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, to facilitate the correlation um, between the light microscopy and SEM images, are there predefined positions similar to mapping position for acquiring LM and SEM images? Or do we need to rotate the stage manually to take the images, then align the LM and EM images? No, there are predefined positions so that allow you to go back and forth from SEM FIP positions to the uh, LM positions. 
So um, that's kind of taking into the, the, the idea of the system that you can go back and forth to this position. So similar like we have positions for the sputter coding or for the lift out uh, procedures. Um, so these positions are kind of saved and you can basically cycle back and forth between the two positions then in this case. Thanks. Next question is, um, reflection mapping is often used to compute fake surface profiles to a sample topology, potentially useful to find spots for lamella imaging or milling. Any idea whether this can be done with the IFLM? Yeah, I, I mentioned it before, so I also showed it on one of the images. Um, there is a reflection imaging um, mode of the system where you can take these images. So in, in theory, you, you won't need the electron beam uh, to localize and, and correlate the information back. So you can do that with this information which comes um, from the from reflective imaging mode. It's quite convenient and it shows actually I was surprised quite a high amount of surface details um, that can be used then to correlate the signal back. Okay, um, another question is kind of going back to um, ion beam and, and the milling. Were the images labeled ion made with a second electron beam integrated with the gallium, gallium beam source? Uh, both images, um, the electron images as well as the ion images, they are detected with um, secondary electrons. So the secondary electron detector is um, detecting the signal here. The um, SEM beam has a different geometry, or looks perpendicular onto the sample, and the ion beam looks under an angle, under a glancing angle of the sample. Uh, but the way these images are computed is uh, purely by the secondary electron detector. Okay, um, thanks for that. So uh, I think we still have quite a few questions about the IFL, so I'll kind of go back to some of those questions. Um, for the fluorescent signal, how intense does it have to be to be visible in the IFLM? Would you be able to spot a labeled trimer? Yeah, it, this is a good question. I mean, ideally, of course, we would like to have a, you know, the best possible NA. On the other hand, we also know in, in cryo, we cannot use uh, immersion uh, optics, uh, which would give us that high NA above one. Um, it wouldn't work uh, also in a, in a high vacuum system, like in an integrated um, FIPSM system. Um, so I think the NA can give us, um, yeah, I mean, some, not the best resolution possible, of course, as we would have with the immersion lens. It's also kind of a, um, a compromise you have to do between the, the working distances and the selection, for instance, of the lens. Um, you can go very narrow, of course, also with um, uh, objectives that have, a, that have an NA um, below one. Um, but there are some limitations also at some point, and the limitations come, for instance, from the, uh, the radiation heat that could come from the objective when it's really close to the sample, uh, which could be an issue. The other thing is uh, just some physical limitations because the sample itself is typically hold within an auto grid carrier, so that's kind of the, the, the loading system for the cryos also. So that has some uh, limited height, um, and then on top of that, auto grid is also clamped by uh, um, just a clamp or spring loader, something like this, so which is kind of um, holding it in place, and that kind of ultimately also uh, brings some limitations to the to the minimum working distance that you can use. So you have to really look at this holistically. So it's kind of that it's also working with all the the use cases in the system that it's still practical with, for instance, the, the shuttles and the other use cases that I, I mentioned before. Okay. Um, another question is, um, are there any benefits of having an external and integrated cryo LM? Yeah, this, this, is a, this is actually a good question. So um, I think there are still benefits in, in having both systems. And uh, as you know, we also worked uh, with Leica together on a, a clam shuttle, which uh, allows to carry uh, the samples um, inside the FIP uh, after imaging them in the, in the Leica clam system. So I think there's still a benefit also using information from the external systems. The IFLM is extending the, I think, the, the versatility of the whole workflow by giving the capability to inspect the samples also in the, in the FIPSAM. So what that means for us is, um, uh, yeah, you know, there are various flavors of external cryo light microscopes. 
um, also confocal systems or advanced imaging systems. So you can use them, of course, to do other things than you could do with such a wide field system. Um, but for instance, you could, um, if you think about the HPF samples, that's uh, very challenging samples. They are thick. They are very hard to correlate. So you could take information, for instance, from such an HPF um, sample from an external light microscope, then go into the Aquilos, use this uh, IFLM to basically correlate uh, that information back. And this is simply not possible before. And, and it's a challenge to do that on such uh, larger complex samples. And that could be, for instance, a use case where both systems uh, really uh, are useful. OK, great. Uh, next question. Uh, can the resulting lamella grids be transferred to other electron microscopes to achieve higher resolution? Uh, I'm not 100% sure what the question means. So that's, of course, the goal of that um, uh, idea is um, to produce a, a thin sample, which is then going to a transmission electron microscope so that we can actually take a, a tomogram, which is then giving us a, a much higher resolution, of course. So the idea is then to uh, to have a certain snapshot of a frozen hydrated native cell um, captured in that lamella to uh, analyze it then with tomography uh, later on. OK. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, there's a question about um, kind of the ice, or sorry, the objective. Um, can the objectives be customizable? Yeah, that's uh, that's also a good uh, good question. So um, it's not impossible to change the objective, but we haven't really foreseen it. And um, uh, there's also a reason because it has an impact on the on the entire system. So that means, for instance, uh, on the focusing positions, on the shuttle, on the on the working distances, the safe moves uh, within the system. Uh, we have to use it also for uh, for other applications, as you saw before. So the idea here is really to uh, come up with a solution that is um, fully compatible with the with the Aquilos two, and that will be also guiding our um, choice of the objective. Okay, um, I think I will try to sneak one more question, with, given the time. Uh, does the IFLM have uh, Z stack imaging? And can we get a projected image? Yeah, with the objective piezo, it's possible to also record some limited set stack information that can be also used for further processing. So that's uh, uh, possible. OK. Um, I think that is all the time we have today. Um, I want to thank you again, Alex, and to all of you for joining us today and for asking your interesting questions. Um, questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during our on-demand period will be addressed um, via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Um, if you are a current customer and would like more information, um, please contact your account manager or please use the contact us form online at thermofisher.com forward slash Aquilos. Uh, this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share this email with your colleagues um, who have, made, have missed today's live event. Um, please join us again on June 24th for our next webinar in our Thermo Fisher Electron Microscopy Monthly Series on Lab Roots on Structural Oncology Fighting Cancer with PARDM. The registration page is open. Until next time, goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>